the, the most sort of archetypal or, or the generic statement is that steroids will, will instantly give you roid rage. Guys seem to think that they're invincible in their 20s. If you continue these practices, you need to be thinking of this long-term health strategy that, you know, one day you're not out in your front garden and you drop dead playing with your your four or five-year-olds. A lot of the issues that I see stem from insecurity and then it's that insecure nature that they then require this quick fix. What's up guys, Andrew Tracy here, Men's Health Fitness Editor. Today I'm chatting to Dr. Dean St. Mark, former drug designer and expert in the field of pharmacology, as well as Thomas Moore, an online vlogger in the fitness space who has long been open about steroid use. We went deep discussing performance enhancing drugs, why people take these compounds, the dangers associated with them and the lack of education around them. We also put to bed some misconceptions on the topic as well as going deep into the role the media plays and whether or not transparency is a necessity. Uh, just to give some context to the rest of the conversation, I wondered if you could give us a sort of brief history of your experience uh, with the topic, your personal experience, just so as, as we go forward, we can kind of know what angle you're coming at it from and listeners can kind of get an idea of your experience and your sort of qualification and education in the field. So uh, Tom, if you wouldn't mind giving us a sort of brief backstory. My experience has been within the industry as a whole, kind of uh, cycling on and off anabolics for the last I'd say seven to eight years. It came at a time where I started to look to to compete in. So I kind of wanted to uh, adopt the model of my pre my previous coach that was very scientific based and and try as best as possible to increase my knowledge within within the area of anabolics and uh, document my journey at the same time because <clears throat> there was very little education on on YouTube bar the kind of stereotypical meatheads like Rich Piana and, and, and Boston. So it was uh, a kind of chance for me to document my own journey as well as as learning as well and uh as of last year i kind of stopped competing and taken a slightly different route and, and uh, decided to kind of look to to come off anabolics and, and stay off anabolics for foreseeable future and tom when you say when you say compete and sport you're you're referring to bodybuilding right i am yeah so i started as a junior and then i competed a couple of times in classic and then uh, did my last two shows last year and then and then called it a day and um just for a bit of context down the line did you com were any of those competitions done uh, unenhanced without steroids? No, they were all done. They were all done enhanced. So it was. I remember kind of saying to a training partner at the time, "I'm going up against these guys," and he was like, "Well, I think you need to start taking anabolics, or you know, consider taking this anabolic and pushing the dose up a little bit." So I was I was very uneducated when it came down to the kind of natural and non natural bodybuilding. I always thought all bodybuilders are assisted and they're all juiced up guys. So I've got to do it. Um, so yeah, I, I'd probably say a, a little regret of mine would be to, to not go into the world of competing naturally, but these things happen. Cool. That's something I'd like to uh, touch on a little bit more later, but uh, first Dean, how about you? What are your experiences uh, in the, the world of anabolics? I guess I was sort of put into the world of anabolics um, by my wife. I was a, a very introverted person and when I met my wife she um she told me I knew you know I knew too much basically to stay quiet surrounding anabolics and I am um, my background is in drug design and pharmacology so obviously I'm you know trained in the aspects of how these compounds work in the body how we might actually apply correct science to the use of anabolic rather than listening to you know gym soap down the gym that's going to hand you a bottle of something to to use i started as an educator on a you know a well-known bodybuilding fitness website and i just started tearing apart all the sort of bro science that came with anabolics and that was sort of probably how tom came across me i just i, I basically had enough of seeing guys hurt themselves because they weren't educated correctly in terms of the science that's applied really if we want to be very straight talking these compounds are medicines they were designed as medicines and unfortunately they were misused for sport so we still have to go back to that viewpoint that first and foremost they're medicines they have a correct application but at some point that correct application has been misused that's actually really nice i'd like to stick on that for a little bit and um I wonder in what ways do you guys think that the mainstream media gets steroid use or abuse wrong? Are there a lot of kind of generally kind of universally held beliefs that are out there, they're in the ether, they're in the media that are just fundamentally wrong in your eyes? The, the most sort of archetypal or, or the generic statement is that 
steroids will, will instantly give you roid rage, which is, I mean, there, there holds some truth to it in the sense that if you have a predisposed or if you are uh, an angry individual, then the, the chances are these anabolics will probably exacerbate that issue. But I think there, there's a few things that the media kind of portray us steroid users to be very kind of dark and very unhealthy. I think they've, they've painted the picture of, of people that are quite uneducated. Um, but unfortunately, there is, a, a, an, and it's not their own fault. It's not the individual's fault. But I think a lot of people do fall into that trap because they go into this process very uneducated and kind of just hearing what, what other individuals have got to say in the gym. The, the real stigma, if you ask anyone about, you know, anabolic use, it's amazing you're going to have a heart attack. And that that may be true, but there's quite a lot of other factors that play into it. Even from a, a medical professional standpoint, none of these topics are covered in medical school, in the UK or worldwide. I've had GPs attend, you know, talks that I've given on this topic surrounding, you know, the pharmacology of these compounds and their, their health side effects. And at the end of the talk, I've had them come up to me and say, you know, that's in that hour talk, you've covered more than what we've done in you know eight years of medical training. So there is a huge disparity in in terms of even the education towards medical professionals to help um, first and foremost keep people healthy and safe, and then also to try and perhaps discourage use, but not with that stigma attached. That. It- it's just a case of erring on the side of caution um, from medical professionals. You know, that it, it's if they're not trained in these subjects, it's just far easier just to wave the hand and say, you know, don't do that. It's incredibly dangerous. Um, do you think that that in its in itself is um, either the lesser of two evils or kind of can create a space of danger where people who are going to otherwise just go away and do this stuff? aren't able to get the information they need or don't even present. You know, it's much in the same way that we talk about not opening up on other subjects. If you kind of know that you're not going to get the response, um, a helpful response, do you think that causes dangers in and of itself? It, it does in certain circumstances. I mean, even the, the popularity of private blood testing companies within the UK in the last 10 years has been exponential because people find it difficult to approach medical professionals on this subject so they'd rather for one side privacy so these results don't land on their sort of public health record but also because they've been made feel that even if they do approach that medical profession to have that blood work done they're not going to get the answers that they require um and again, that's probably a lack of education. You know, when blood work comes back from an anabolic user, there are things that are going to be skewed, but they're going to be skewed within the norms of anabolic use that wouldn't be necessarily educated in terms of mainstream medicine. So, it, you know, if you, if you got a normal person's blood work and an enhanced user's blood work, there's going to be some things in the red on the enhanced user's blood work but within the sort of context of what's going on, they're probably relatively healthy, if that makes sense. So all of a sudden you have medical professionals making people panic that their, you know, that their kidneys are damaged, that, you know, they've got really bad plaque formation in their heart for, you know, having a heart attack. There's, there's all these sort of things that really, I think, like you said, it's it, from one side, there's a privacy aspect where someone's really doesn't want to entertain having this conversation with their, their GP. And on the other side, they actually have probably come to realise either through word of mouth or from personal experience, that's just a waste of time. I don't mean to, uh, to sort of denigrate the institution, but I do wonder if perhaps there's something in there in the UK with regards to the fact we do have the NHS, we do have a a kind of free healthcare system as such. Um, I wonder if that kind of puts people off of, of going to, you know, going to see their GP for blood work, et cetera. Whereas if we had, if we'd grown up in an environment where privatized, um, medical services were the norm, perhaps that might be a little bit more normalized if that makes sense. But do you guys both, encourage um users or of of anabolics to to get regular blood work and to have regular talks with with people who can assess that blood work properly yeah yeah i mean that's sort of where my my popularity came about was that i i started to 
openly offer a consultancy service to people to go through their blood work and get them to understand, you know, in the full context of what they're doing. Are they, you know, either heading towards a dangerous path or are there, you know, strategies that can be implemented to lower the risk to their overall health? It's, it's definitely something that has become <clears throat> very mainstream now in the last two to three years is getting blood work done as an enhanced user because of the, the availability and the open accessibility to getting it done. The, the problem that is now arising is that because of the open accessibility to it, guys are getting their blood work done quite regularly, which is great but not taking action to the blood work. So it's almost like it's seen as a, a task to commit to, but not actually then, then take an action on that task. So they get their blood work every three or four months, blood work comes back and they sort of look and go, okay, but they continue doing what they're doing. It's great on one aspect that guys are becoming more health conscious, but on the other side, it is feeding into almost like a, a dangerous psychology that they, they get their bloods done and in, in some cases, guys remain ignorant. So they get their blood done. And because they've had their blood done, you don't even look at the results. It's just sort of like a, mm. an exercise to get their blood done. Yeah, it's almost as if they're, they're, they're offsetting this. You know, I'm the responsible one. So nothing bad can happen to me because I get my blood done and there's no there's no further action in of that. Um, just to kind of, uh, kind of have some balance here, what do you guys see, uh, you know, or what have you experienced as the most realistic risks of um anabolic use and anabolic abuse i do want to kind of separate the two but of anabolic use what are the kind of biggest risks what are the things you look out for in in bloods and in anabolic abuse what are the things that you know really do happen what we're noticing is the downplaying of the results so i'll have clients come to me that have been there's this uh we, we call it blasting and cruising in, in the industry. So it's going through a period of time where you take quite a large amount of anabolics and then you dip back down into a, a, a physiological range. And they spend such a short amount of time in this physiological range and don't correct the issues with their blood work. Then they go back into it and they just kind of layer this effect. So the increase over a, a prolonged period of time is the issues with lipids, is the issues with liver, for example. So that's what I tend to see is when a client comes to me that's been adopting a blast and cruiser model for some time and hasn't rectified the original issue and, and it's just kind of layered that effect of of their blood work it's it's all well and good to do your sort of blast which i preferred to call a cycle so you're doing your cycle of of steroids mm -hmm. but then you're better off serving yourself up with a period if you're going to continue to use where you use maybe a dose of testosterone that's physiological so you've moved your health basically to where it would be if you came off. Yeah, and it just ends up compounding. Exactly. Hmm. What are the the major dangers of of you know pursuing that for too long? So if you're never actually coming off, you're never really giving your body time to recover. What are the main dangers that people face? So obviously, if if your HDL is being impacted long term. It's not that we view, you know, HDL as being like good cholesterol and LDL being bad cholesterol. They're two sort of transporters in our body that have different functions. HDL brings fats and lipids back to your liver to recycle them so you, you get rid of them out of your body. And LDL transports fats and cholesterol to your cells to be used. Now, the issue there is that when you have lower levels of HDL, you don't have this higher recycling capability. So there's a lot more risk towards dysfunction where that LDL particle might get oxidized and damaged and that feeds into plaque formation. So chronically having low levels of HDL alongside environmental factors feeding into that oxidation of the LDL particles more than likely will contribute towards an arteroma or plaque development in the arteries over a period of time guys seem to think that they're invincible in their 20s which you know to a certain degree there, there is a bit of flexibility there we, we can't deny that that you can do some silly things for two or three years and you know what is the ultimate long impact to your health no one could really say that but in you know in simple terms 
the risk is probably marginalized. Whereas, you know, if you continue these practices from your 20s into your 30s and potentially early 40s with competitive bodybuilding and, and the, the time that people engage in the sport, you know, you, you need to be thinking of this long term health strategy that, you know, one day you're not out in your front garden and you drop dead playing with your your four or five year olds. And that that is happening quite regularly that like what we even say with the media there are quite a number of deaths and and I see it personally through working with some of the the sort of privatized health clinics that deal with anabolic users that just is not made mainstream and and I've had you know horrific case reports of people who have who have even taken their lives because of the impact that anabolics have had to their life causing serious health issues which for example, kidney damage, kidney failure, resulting in having to do dialysis. And these guys, unfortunately, just don't want any part of that for the long-term future and have, have taken their lives, unfortunately. So it's, it, 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 it's a really complex situation, as you can see, but there's it, trying to get that education out there now to 20 to 30-year-olds about that long-term risk strategy, in my opinion, is, is vitally important. Well, that's uh, it's incredibly sort of unsettling to hear. Just quickly, why do you think that is, that, that those kind of things aren't publicized when we do talk about this and we do talk about the dangers of anabolics anyway? That is a very good question. I mean, uh, we, we know obviously that the whole sort of, I guess jovial side of it is, you know, roid rage and guys smashing things up in, in a rage. But the other side of it that doesn't really get publicized, then obviously, is the domestic relationship disturbance that comes with anabolic use. And, and like Tom said, we can't really say, you know, steroids cause roid rage. What, what really happens from a scientific perspective is that it amplifies your personality. What what tends to happen in our brains is androgens will increase the amount of dopamine that your brain makes. So that's sort of where the, the positives of, you know, increased libido, increased strength, all these sort of more motivation, more drive. That's what sort of drives guys into to anabolic use. But on the other side, it can disturb the serotonin balance of your brain and it can make you quite volatile that at any moment, you know, there could be just a, a sudden shift in that serotonin to dopamine balance that all of a sudden sends you into a rage that would not normally happen neurochemically if you weren't using these things. The media probably, to try and give a more broad view would be then to move away from that, that stigma of use. And you'd, you'd almost have, you know, if, if you reported, let's say, John a 45 year old who has three kids. He's a successful businessman. He competed as a bodybuilder for 10 years, dropped dead out in his front garden of a heart attack. You know, if you reported on that, it'd be a tragic story. But then if you report on that, where you spin on it, that, oh, by the way, John took anabolics for 10 years. Now, all of a sudden, the, the, the public are starting to create that stigma again of, oh, well, steroids are bad. Steroids killed, you know, John. You know, you can see where this is a very delicate subject that if you were to report in the media as well, that it has to be balanced in how it's reported. If you were to be really honest, John's diet since he stopped bodybuilding might not be all that correct. And John's eating, you know, a lot of fats that can get oxidized in his body and he doesn't take care of his health in terms of health supplementation that's available to him. He doesn't get regular health checks since finishing. So there's all these things that play into how John could have had that heart attack. Yeah, yeah, I can completely understand that. Tom, what are some of the the kind of the, the, the bad symptoms or the bad kind of outcomes of abuse and abuse that you see presented in the gym, perhaps um, from people that don't necessarily you know these guys aren't getting their blood work done you have no kind of uh insight into what's going on in their body what are the external um kind of poor outcomes 
So the telltale signs are probably an increase in, in kind of oily skin. You could, if an individual isn't managing their estrogen properly, then the potential for outbreaks in, in acne as well and being quite spotty. We've obviously got things like hair loss as well, if DHT isn't controlled. So those things, again, they can be quite acute or they can occur over a long period of time. I've known people that have kind of managed their estrogen quite well and introduced another compound and then straight away they kind of they're skewed a little bit. But those would be... Um, probably the telltale visual signs of an individual. Something you touched on back then, which I think is really quite important, is this kind of mashup of, of anabolics of, of these performance enhancing drugs and um, recreational drugs, you know, party drugs. Do you think, is there any kind of credence to the idea that a lot of the bad rep steroids get in general is kind of a result of um, individuals who are you know mixing these two worlds as such do they do they kind of um exaggerate one another you go out on a saturday night and see individuals that aren't on anabolics that are taking recreational drugs there's you know there, there's mm. not any less I, I do feel like it's almost like a double whammy of serotonin you've got this this increased level of confidence because you look a certain way and you have the anabolics in your system but you're also taking the recreational drugs so you know you're kind of doubling up a little bit and what what goes up must come down so you're seeing these huge variations in kind of emotion i can again speak firsthand of, of going through quite a rigorous six month contest prep and then going to ibiza it's like that you're living in this kind of make-believe hyper reality whereby you're taking these recreational drugs you're taking these anabolic steroids and then the, the crash afterwards is is appalling so do you think that you know despite the fact the these compounds aren't in and of themselves uh they don't create a sort of physiological uh, dependence addiction in a, the way we think about something like nicotine or cocaine or heroin whatever it might be because of that kind of raising of that that threshold that you're talking about that is essentially creating an a, a kind of behavioral addiction pattern oh yeah no 100 percent. and it's and it's something that isn't really even well known amongst you know experienced pharmacologists in in the industry of of steroid use this is a a a concept that's only really come out in the last two to three years. And it's more so associated with very strong androgens like trembolone um, and how trembolone upsets uh, dopamine chemistry in the brain. So that post trembolone use um, and guys do recover, their brain is, their brain's not capable of functioning correctly because they're not able to get the same amount of dopamine into the neurons to feel sexually excited. It's an area that more so needs to be made aware to guys that, okay, you're not going to become physically dependent on these things, but if you play with these long enough, it's going to cause neural issues that are, is going to leave you with, with quite a rough um, neurochemistry pattern whereby you end up sort of thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to using these things because they made me feel good. Tom, is this something you've experienced that you could speak on? Absolutely. As I mentioned, this is the longest period of time that I've been on a kind of physiological normal normal range of testosterone. And I very much plan to come off c completely. I just need to find a kind of time psychologically where I accept the, that kind of uh, that small lull. But uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, Dean mentioned a compound called Trend Fremblone and it's, it's, it's a, a particular compound that even when mentioned on a prep, I remember my coach I'm saying, we're going to look to introduce that. It's like, Oh God, I actually have to go through this again. If I, if I could go through a prep without using it, then, then I'll do, I wouldn't do so. But it, 100%, I think more so for me, it's that feeling of kind of being in this particular bubble, then post show, and then the the drop is 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 the most noticeable for me. It's it's definitely difficult. But I think even those that are mentally resilient, I still feel like they have a tough time. You know, I've got close friends within the industry that have experienced it too. It's just kind of creating almost like a, almost like an exit plan whereby you have to psychologically prepare that, okay, post show, I'm going to feel this way. I need to then implement certain techniques that are going to help rectify this issue. This, this idea of, um, you know, using anabolic steroids, using performance enhancing drugs to alter how you look to go and look a certain way on holiday. Do you think this is new or relatively new? Or do you, do you think this kind of abuse has always been around? We're seeing more more uh, individuals in the success post certain shows. You know, we famous shows like Love Island, you, you're seeing guys that are changing their physique within six to eight weeks in order to 
you know, become this individual that on the show, they're going to get recognized and they can essentially use that to catapult themselves in the world of personal training and the fitness industry. It's been about for years, you know, but what we're seeing now is a shift in, in engagement and emotion toward anabolics. And, and back in the day, we kind of heard this term fake natty, which was an individual that's clearly on anabolics, but would, you know, keep stern because of the potential knock-on effects with sponsorship or even the potential kind of thought process that if they were to tell people, they'd be, you know, um, class as cheating or what you're, you know, what you're doing is wrong and things like that. But what you're seeing now is, is it shifted a little bit to whereby even the younger generations that are coming through have been so open about anabolics. And I think we're, we're heading in, I think it's positive, but I also feel like we're heading into some sort of murky waters at the point whereby me openly talking about this, I'm gaining respect straight away. And like, I'm being this transparent individual and I'm, I must demand respect. So yeah, I think it, it, it's always been about, it's just more prevalent. We can see it firsthand now through social media. Yeah. Let, let's touch on something that I think is really important. Um, what part do you think uh, the media play, the media at large, I mean, print media, I mean us, I mean the internet, I mean social media, what part do you think we play um, for better or worse kind of in this in this sphere? Like I said, it's really hard because on, on one hand, you want to sit here and, and, you know, the likes of Dr. Dean will, will speak openly about um, anabolic steroids, but what we don't want is to for people to see that and go, oh, well, it's, it's safe, you know, just because, mm. because Dean's talking about it, because Tom's spoken from experience, be crucial that we, you know, get that element of interpreting blood work, you know, and also telling people that we need to kind of almost squeeze this, this stone, uh, the blood out of the stone naturally before you'd even consider, you know, I'm, I'm, my kind of stance has changed massively to the point where by people come to me asking about anabolics, I, mine's just like a you know, flat out. No, unless they have trained naturally for 10 years or are competing the average Joe that has just gone on holiday in 10 weeks time. I'm just like, absolutely not. So it's, it's really hard to find that balance. I feel. Dean, do you think the media um, contributes to, let's just, you know, as sad as it is, it contributes to young men feeling the need to take um, anabolic supplements or sort of anabolic compounds? Last year, I was training at a gym in Dublin where my parents live and I was getting changed in an income five, like 16 year olds. And the first question they asked was, hey, mister, what do you take? That was the first question I came out of my mouth was, what do you take? And I remember like, just turn them back to me going, well, try taking, you know, 15 years of training and <laughs> training five days a week and not missing meals. And then we can discuss over stuff of what you're taking. And I mean, that's, that's a 16 year old, a 16 year old's first reaction to someone who has a, a, a developed physique is what do you take? We've moved away from sort of the, the whole sort of blogging setting of Facebook to a complete visual perspective on social media of pictures and um, physiques you know years ago you would have bought magazines you know physical prints like men's health and you would open it you would have seen physiques within it and uh, me personally would have never even thought in my head you know even as a 20 year old looking at these magazines of oh I wonder what they take you're more so you're reading articles on oh look at the nutrition look at the training you, your your brain like it's it's definitely trade sort of this sort of mindset of physiques aren't attainable now without these, these compounds. And the, the more worrying thing is the open accessibility of these compounds. It, it was sort of, you know, anabolics use in, in perhaps like the, the 90s was sort of like a, a closed... Um, society or a closed group like you couldn't just walk into a gym and, and say to the guy behind you know the gym counter oh, i'm gonna do anabolics because he'd probably try you out of the gym you know it was it was sort of viewed as sort of like you had to earn the respect to use these compounds and you it, it's not like now today i often joke you just have to walk into any gym find the biggest guy and go oh, i want to do gear and and he'll just take out a bag and go oh yeah here you go 50 euro 50 pounds and that, that's really worrying that a 15, 60-year-old will, will do this daily in gyms across the UK and Ireland. You know, it's, it's very worrying even for me as a parent that the possibility that, you know, your 15 or 16-year-old could be using these oral steroids without your, your knowledge of using them. Never mind, you know, the, the accessibility of injectable drugs. These oral steroids bring very big health risks with them and are so easily accessible. 
there has to be sort of some sort of change points in getting kids to start understanding that there's more to, I guess, health and fitness and physique development than, than steroids. And uh, my, my personal opinion is when we, we kind of create this idea that anyone who remotely, as, as you say, with your experience in the gym, anyone who remotely looks, uh, you know, quote unquote, in shape must be on steroids. And this finger pointing that goes on, on, on social media, I do often worry that it, that, is, you know, that is what does more harm than good because we're creating this environment where young men uh, are, what, are looking at these you know, fairly achievable sort of celebrity physiques. Now, there's no knowing, you know, unless you're them, there's no knowing to with certain individuals for sure, whether or not they have used any sort of performance enhancing drug. But I worry that by constantly pointing that finger and saying, Ex celebrity did you know steroids growth hormone and it's it's the willingness to name these compounds as well which gets me are we creating an environment where young men are looking and going well that must just be the only way to do it combined with as you say this environment where it's much more spoken about and it's much you know it's not fringe it's not niche it's not just for like the you know the huge meatheads at the at the like spit and sawdust gym i i've often thought about i don't really have any any solution to how we how we tackle this sort of the monsters out of the box and and how do we how do we contain it um you know on one hand we can't go back to sort of the archaic age where we're we're ignoring it and just it's the elephant in the room and we're not going to speak about it but you know on the other side we're we're making it very accessible like we've said to to young kids to to look at these things that should really you know, in, in all honesty, like what, what Tom said, should be decisions that are made perhaps in your, your late 20s, early 30s, attaining a, a, an aesthetic physique, a muscular physique, isn't that difficult at all once the discipline and the nutrition to train, everything is there. These compounds, of course, will speed things up, but there's, there's nothing that you can't outdo hard work. Because effectively, we, we all know guys who have taken these compounds and got no results there we can't be viewing them all so that you know that we, we take these compounds and all of a sudden in six weeks time you've put on 10 kilos of muscle and you've lost five kilos of body fat it's it, the same sort of work ethic has to apply when you use these compounds to when you are natural uh, the main sort of thing that you're going to get out of this is that your training frequency and your recovery is going to be augmented and your ability to retain protein tissue increases. That, that's the only difference between you as an enhanced versus you as a natural. So it, it, the, the underlying development of physique still comes from the, the nutrition and the training. Everyone else is doing this. So like you say, the, the demon's out of the box. So I guess now we are in the situation where education is important. Uh, Tom, is there anything that you think that mainstream media could do better in terms of its portrayal of uh, of not just anabolics, but men's you know men's physique, men's physicality, a uh, gym culture at large. Probably one of the biggest things would, would be raising awareness around kind of mental health and and the psychology of, of one's appearance. I think a lot of the issues that I see stem from insecurity, and then it's that insecure nature that they then re- require this quick fix. I, I think that the biggest area. And we always discuss mental health and the importance of, you know, ensuring that it's, it's A1 at all times would be to, to, to kind of to tackle that particular side of things, I feel anyway. And then we can start to look at the kind of education toward, you know, the, the intricacies into things like blood work interpretation and things like that. But psychology, I feel, would be probably one of the biggest ones. Do you think that uh, people who are public facing, have a, a big public image, should be more transparent? Or do you think that ultimately that would do more harm than good? Depending on whether or not they are or aren't taking things, but you aren't going to be in a position whereby a large actor is going to, even if they are come out and openly, mm. they just won't do it. Their, their management, yeah. their, they just would not happen. So we can't even probably question that. The, the Probably the, the lower rankings, potentially, I remember there being some issue with Spencer Matthews going into the Armour Celebrity because he was taking like, or Diana Bowl. and then as soon as that story came out it, it, again the stigmas it, yeah. m- more often than not it, we're attaching ourselves to that stigma again so I feel like when the bigger guys come out and, and the gem pop understand it straight away I mean I go, go to festivals all the time and we always 
tend to talk about this topic of anabolics and straight away it's like i'll kill you or do this and do that so mm. i even think the bigger names openly talking about is probably going to do not you know very little good if i'm being completely honest with you i think it's i think it's down to almost the uh, micro influencers like you know myself and dean to to kind of spread that and for them to have that knock-on effect to for it to to spread to other individuals the other side of it then is it's not like even if we were to pick some big actor it's not like some big actor is going to sit down and go, you know what, I'm going to do tread and test for this movie role. It's more than likely they have a team of medical advice. They have management. It's not like they're sitting down and going to the manager. Oh, I'm going to have to do the cyclosteroids to get this movie role. So even then from them being transparent, it's not that they've actually went and done their research either. So they're sort of their message of, you know, this is OK to use isn't really from their own perspective. They've probably been told, go have a chat with this doctor, he'll explain it, and then they've gone, okay, yep, yep, whatever you say. And and that, to me, from, you know, an an outsider with this sort of medical knowledge, to me, in terms of if we're going to talk along the lines of celebrities, is more than likely the, 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 the reality, the truth that is occurring. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, Fantastic, if not a bit of a dour place to end things uh, in that it, it leaves us in a little bit of a no-win situation. But um, I think we're I think we're getting there across the board with, uh, you know, education and, and awareness and um, just a, a general raising of the bar in terms of, uh, you know, what information is out there in order to help people make informed decisions. Guys, thank you so much for your, your time this morning. It's been absolutely incredible. And I hope there's some useful advice in there for everyone listening. 